starting off with, well, what aspects of violence and aggression are unique to humans? And what the theme has been there for decades now is all sorts of domains that used to be thought to be unique to humans no longer are. We've already heard some of these examples way back in the sociobiology lectures, all of those wildlife films where somewhere in there somebody with a very deep voice has to intone about how only man kills for pleasure when watching some beasts throwing the old wildebeest into the river there and misinterpreting it. And that was always the theme where you're the only species that kills. And that went down the tubes way back when, as soon as people started seeing competitive infanticide. That was first seen, again, I think I mentioned, when Langer monkeys, a primatologist named Sarah Hurdy, who was at Harvard at the time, and she was the first to report this, and this could not be, that male Langer monkeys were killing babies. This was impossible, and the interpretation was that this was a psychopathology. This was because of increasing habitat degradation, human populations getting closer, crowding them in. These were populations in, of uh, Langer monkeys in some urban areas in India where she was studying them. This is not normal because no other species kills. And now that it's up to 20, 25 different species or so that does competitive infanticide, it is quite clear we are not the only species that kills. And we are not the only species that kills in some premeditated, strategic, Machiavellian, good for numbers of copies of our genes kind of way. We are not the only ones. Jane Goodall, by now, having documented lots and lots of cases of murder between chimps, females killing each other's babies, males killing other males quite frequently, and once again, we are not the only species. What's also become clear from more recent work with chimpanzees is we're not the only species that makes weapons. Chimps have now been observed to take large, heavy branches and break off the ancillary branches there and smooth it out and use it as a weapon to try to hit another animal. This is tool use and tool production. This is another species making a weapon. We are also not the only species that has organized violence. And this is back again to chimps, something mentioned way back when in the lectures, the facts that chimps are female exogamous, that business that at puberty, it's the females who pick up and move to a different group. All of the adult males in a chimp group are relatively related to each other. They are relatives. And what you get then is cooperative aggression among males from a particular group. What you will see is border patrols. Goodall was the first to use this term to describe it. You will get the males of a group will get into an extremely agitated state with each other, a state of emotional contagion, where they build up this very high level of excitation, and they then and go and patrol the territory between their group and the next group over. And what Goodall was the first to document was, if they encounter a male from the other group, they will kill him. And what she also documented was cases of groups of male chimps systematically killing all of the males of the neighboring group. What is it that we've just seen now in another species? Genocide. The notion of killing an individual not because of who they are, but because of what group, what population they belong to as part of a desire to eradicate a population as a whole. We are not the only species that has something resembling genocide if it's termed that way. So. Where is a domain where we might be unique? Lots of people still argue that humans are the only species that psychopathologically confuse sexual behavior with aggressive behavior, world of sadism and masochism and all of that. That appears to be something resembling a human unique trait. Okay, now flipping to the more cheerful side of things, the cooperation, the empathy stuff, what aspects of those behaviors are unique to humans? And what people used to think was a exclusively human ability, yeah? Are there any instances where, um, where certain groups of monkeys will not only just kill all the males in a different group, but kill all females in a different group? Yeah, they will kill the infants out of competitive infanticide stuff, and they will then happily hang with the females. Okay. 
and do more than that with any luck. Um, in terms of, oh, a very familiar historical strategy with humans, uh, seen again and again. Good end of things. Used to be the rule that humans were the only species that showed reconciliation, that showed increased likelihood of affiliative behavior between two individuals after they have had an aggressive interaction. In the aftermath of it, increased odds of doing something affiliative, making up, reconciling, doing something along those lines. And what has emerged in the last 20 years or so is a huge literature showing reconciliative behavior in a couple of dozen other species. First person to report this, primatologist Franz Duval, first reporting this in rhesus monkeys, I believe, but lots of other species since then, including dolphins, including whales. And what you see is, in the aftermath of a fight, you see two individuals are more likely, in gorillas, for example, to do social grooming in the aftermath than at any other time, an increased rate of that happening, reconciliation. What's remarkable is some of the subtleties in it. And this was work that was done by Marina Cords at Columbia. And what she showed was the odds of reconciliation increase when it's a more important, valuable relationship that you have. How was she showing this? These were studies with macaque monkeys. And what she did was set up circumstances. These were animals that were uh, caged and there were circumstances where she put food on a tray outside that could be reached for, where in one setting, an animal could get the food in all on its own. And in another setting, the only way to get the food tray close enough to the cage was if both of them cooperated, and this was what they were doing habitually. So what's the difference there? In the second case, you have formed this cooperative relationship with this other individual. You need them and they need you to pull off this getting the food close to the cage business. What she showed was significantly higher rates of reconciliation between pairs that have a history of cooperating. What could that be interpreted as? More of a game theory history of cooperation behind you, more willingness to forgive. Another way of framing it, as she does in her work, is this is a more valuable relationship that you don't want to screw up. You are more willing to do something reconciliative afterward. You can see in baboons um, reconciling behavior in females. No male baboons ever reconcile showing gender differences there. In bonobos, you see reconciliation is different from all these other species, where in all the other ones it's built around social grooming or chimp hugs or whatever. There, of course, as you guessed it, it's sex, because with the bonobos, anything that happens and it's time to have sex. But an interesting thing in terms of this picture of bonobos being this incredibly peaceful species out there in this commune and all of that, um, you can't have reconciliation unless you have aggression. They, they do have aggressive interactions, otherwise there would be nothing to reconcile afterward. Even the beatific bonobos have a certain degree of aggression, very high and varied rates, varied abilities to pull off reconciliative behavior afterward. 